So what I want to do here is have a discussion about the Justice League. And what I'm hoping is that at the end of all this, you'll have a strong understanding of how the team originated, as well as how it's changed over the course of its publication history in DC Comics. So the Justice League first appeared in Brave and the Bold issue number 28. Initially being introduced as an anthology series for Golden Age characters that didn't have a large enough fan base to warrant their own solo series, Brave and the Bold served as a way for DC to keep these stories going alongside a series of others in an anthology format and that readers could enjoy their favorite Golden Age heroes without DC losing money on low-selling titles. However, with Barry Allen's 1956 introduction serving as a way to reinvigorate interest in DC Comics, in October of 1959, The Brave and the Bold was switched over to a series that kept its anthology format, but rather than showcasing Golden Age heroes, instead, the series showcased new heroes in order to gauge fan reception for these various creations. As a result, in 1960, DC editor Julius Schwartz had tasked writer Gardner Fox with reintroducing the Justice Society of America. Originally appearing in 1940 as a way for DC to experiment with a team of their most popular characters minus Batman and Superman in order to boost sales during the Golden Age comic boom, in 2005 in his book Justice League Companion, historian Michael Urey had stated that when Gardner Fox was given this task, because baseball was such a huge part of American culture and was split into the American League and National Leagues, Gardner Fox chose to incorporate this element into the team as a way to maintain its ties to pop culture. As a result, in Brave and the Bold issue number 28, the Justice League was introduced under the name Justice League of America. However, because Brave and the Bold was a title based on experimentation, Gardner Fox did not provide an origin story for the team in this first issue. Instead, he treated the team as if it had already been established and introduced a villain named Starro. As the story goes, with Peter the Pufferfish communicating with Aquaman, it had stated that an alien in the form of a starfish had arrived on Earth with the intention of conquering it. Modifying two other starfish and turning them into a replication of itself, Aquaman realized that the threat was too large for him to face on his own. Sending out a distress signal, Gardner Fox established that the original Justice League was composed of Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman, the Green Lantern, the Flash, Aquaman, and Martian Manhunter. Using this platform, Gardner Fox removed Superman by placing him in deep space, destroying meteors that posed a threat to the Earth, and organized the story in a fashion that saw the various Starro clones facing off against the rest of the Justice League individually in a series of mini-stories which led to the main Starro facing the League itself. In the first story titled Green Lantern vs. Starro, Hal Jordan found one of the clones attacking an Air Force jet. Realizing that the clone had attacked the jet for the purpose of acquiring the atomic bomb it had on board, Hal Jordan is able to save the jet once it's discarded by the clone. After detonating the atomic bomb, the clone absorbs the energy, and while Hal Jordan takes a few moments to understand why, he ends up ignoring this and instead chooses to attack and destroy the clone before it can do anything with the absorbed energy. Using the real-world physiology of a starfish in that the center eye also contains the various organs needed for self-replication, Gardner Fox establishes that this center is the weak point. Attacking it in the eye, Hal Jordan is able to cut off the connection between Starro and the clone, causing the starfish to revert back to its normal form. In the second story, the conflict switches to the perspective of Martian Manhunter and Wonder Woman. With another one of the clones attacking the Hall of Science, Wonder Woman establishes that the greatest scientific minds of the time work from this building. Intending to capture the greatest minds in the world, the clone takes the Hall of Science from its foundation and begins to carry it away. Chasing after it, Wonder Woman uses her lasso in an attempt to ensnare the clone and keep it from traveling further away. However, because the clone possesses so much strength, Wonder Woman is quite literally carried with it. With Superman destroying the meteors before they can reach Earth, Martian Manhunter uses this to his advantage by allowing the smaller meteorite fragments to enter the atmosphere and uses his breath to blow them at the clone. With Wonder Woman using her lasso a second time combined with her robot jet to pull the science hall to safety, the exhaustion of its energy stores causes the clone to weaken and revert back to its normal form. Transitioning to The Flash, the comic picks up in a place called Happy Harbor and a teenager named Snapper. Receiving his nickname due to his penchant for snapping his fingers, Snapper finds the town of Happy Harbor under the mental control of one of the clones. Having recently put lime on the front lawn of his family's home to treat the grass, Snapper finds that he alone is not affected by the mental powers of the clone. Realizing this, the clone attempts to kill Snapper by shooting him with an energy beam, but Barry Allen arrives at the last moment and saves him. Engaging the clone in battle, Barry Allen is able to use his speed to overpower the clone. Retreating to the water, Barry is able to follow and uses his feet to vibrate the lake and as a result, locates the clone and allows the water to smash into it, killing it in the process. 
And so in the third part of the story, which focuses on the main Starro, we learn that during the various conflicts, the first clone had relayed the atomic energy it absorbed to the second clone. The second clone had relayed its knowledge of the scientist to the third clone, which developed the ability to control minds. Using his knowledge, Starro intends to force the world's leaders to detonate all of the atomic bombs so that it can absorb all of the radiation. Because the world will be destroyed as a result, Starro declares that it will use his experience in this conflict as well as the power gained to take over other planets. Arriving to defeat Starro, the Flash realizes the Snapper was protected from the mental powers of the third clone due to the fact that he had been exposed to Lyme. Using this knowledge, Hal Jordan takes several barrels of the powder from a local farmer and douses Starro, which kills the alien and saves the world. Furthermore, due to his help, Snapper is made an honorary member of the Justice League. Now following the introduction of the League in Brave and the Bold, the concept was extremely well received among fans. While the team would go on to be featured in issues number 29 and 30, in November of 1960, the League received its own series titled Justice League of America. While the titles were consistently billed as revolving around the original roster, in truth, for a large portion of the early series, Batman and Superman remained absent. The reason for this was because their solo stories were some of DC's highest selling at the time. As a result, fans largely believed that each comic was on a day-by-day -day basis, and that if Superman or Batman were to suddenly appear in a Justice League comic, it would end up causing confusion in terms of continuity. Furthermore, the basis behind the Justice League was to provide dual exposure for the rest of the lineup in that their solo stories continued, but in order to keep them popular, they were put together on a team which kept them fresh in the minds of fans. While sales would dip occasionally, whenever this happened, DC would introduce Batman and Superman into a story in order to reinvigorate interest and then remove them once sales had increased again. In addition to this, with the flash of two worlds establishing the multiverse in 1961, in August and September of 1963 with issues 21 and 22, under Gardner Fox, DC launched a two-part story titled Crisis on Earth 1 and Crisis on Earth 2, which saw the Golden Age Justice Society reintroduced and teaming up with the Silver Age Justice League to fight villains from both universes. While this would see the first time that these two teams met one another, because it was so well received by fans, the team-ups between the two groups was continued and in August of 1964 with issue number 27, DC had both groups face off against the evil version of the Justice League called the Crime Syndicate of America in a story titled The Eye Who Defeated the Justice League. However, by issue number 65 in 1968, while he had removed Wonder Woman and introduced Black Canary, Green Arrow, and the Atom in her stead, Gardner Fox left the title and was replaced by Dennis O'Neill. With Superman's popularity increasing due to Mort Weisinger's expansion of the character, which also included more spacefaring adventures, O'Neill sought to include this element into the Justice League title. Launching a story called Snapper Car, Super Trader, O'Neill had Snapper tricked by the Joker into revealing the location of the Justice League's hidden base of operations in Happy Harbor. Using this information, Joker then adopted the fake identity of John Doe and revealed this location in addition to launching a campaign aimed at accusing the Justice League of intending to overthrow the government. While the Joker was captured and defeated, O'Neill removed the team from Happy Harbor under the pretense that a new location was needed and in issue number 78, placed the Justice League in space using an old satellite as their new base of operations. While Dennis O'Neill's first run was short-lived in that he had departed the title after issue number 99, during his time writing the Justice League, he began the process of deviating away from the standard fare of heroes battling villains and began to introduce more politically charged themes. Furthermore, with Justice League issue number 71, following the introduction of New Mars and a dwindling appearance in the series due to a lack of popularity among readers and poor sales from his own stories, Dennis O'Neill wrote a story titled Death Orbit which centered on the reintroduction of Martian Manhunter's race and their desire to include him among their ranks. As a result, the Justice League title saw the removal of Martian Manhunter in addition to DC canceling his own solo series. However, with issue number 99, Dennis O'Neill had left the series in order to help Neil Adams revitalize Green Arrow within the pages of Adventure Comics, and in turn, the Justice League title was handed over to Lynn Wine, who wrote issues 100 through 114. While Lynn Wine kept the element of the satellite headquarters of the Justice League, over the course of his time in the series, he continued the trend of adding various members of the DC hero community to the League's roster, including the Elongated Man in issue number 105 and Red Tornado in issue number 106. However, by issue number 115, Wine had left the series and was replaced by a series of writers for issues 115 through 151, including Carrie Bates, Elliot S. Morgan, and Jerry Conway. While Jerry Conway had been writing for both Marvel and DC at the time with stories from action comics and adventure comics, among others, as well as the creation of characters like Power Girl, following his story of the night Gwen Stacy died in 1972 for Marvel Comics and his shuffling around the Marvel landscape, he eventually left Marvel and became the lead writer for the Justice League of America, 
with issue number 151 in 1978. Considered to be one of the longest running writers of the series which ended with issue number 255, during his time on the title, Jerry Conway maintained much of the established history of the team, including the introduction of new members, crossovers with the Earth 2 Justice Society of America, which included the 1979 crossover story that also saw the death of Terry Sloan, the original Mr. Terrific from the Golden Age of Comics. However, because the Marvel titles like the X-Men were incorporating more teenage elements into their stories as well as real-world events, in Justice League Annual No. 2 in 1984 titled The End of the Justice League, the team was completely revamped with the original members of Batman, The Flash, Green Lantern, Superman, and Wonder Woman replaced by a new team with both familiar and younger faces, including Aquaman, Zatanna, Elongated Man, The Vixen, and a trio of teenage boys, Gypsy, Steel, and Vibe, as well as the returning Martian Manhunter. While the title lasted three years, fans began to drop off due to a lack of interest and with issue number 261 in 1987, DC cancelled the new line as part of their year-long plan to reboot their entire continuity with Crisis on Infinite Earths. So following the Crisis on Infinite Earths event in 1987 and DC's relaunch of their various titles, because the Justice League of America was initially considered to be so popular among readers, DC kept the series going under the control of Keith Griffin and J.M.D. Mateus. However, rather than having a team centered on American-centric members, instead, Griffin expanded the team to become an international group that would serve to protect the world as a whole, rather than America itself. While the Justice League was functioning as a worldwide group, what this change did was allow DC to incorporate a more multicultural lineup among its members. To this end, the new title maintained the name Justice League, but because the fallout from Crisis on Infinite Earth saw Superman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash being revamped or relaunched by John Byrne, George Perez, and Mike Barron respectively, the original roster consisted of Batman, Black Canary, Blue Beetle, Captain Marvel, Doctor Fate, Doctor Light, Guy Gardner, Martian Manhunter, Mr. Miracle, and Abron. With this new team taking the Justice League name for the first six issues, with issue number seven, the title was officially named Justice League International. Furthermore, because the stories within contained both comedy and action, the title was successful among readers, and in April of 1989, DC launched a companion series called Justice League Europe. Moving Keith Griffin and DiMatteis away from the international team to this new title, the original team of JLE consisted of Captain Adam as the field commander, who led the Elongated Man, Power Girl, Wally West, Rocket Red, Animal Man, and Metamorpho. Following this, the Justice League International title was renamed to Justice League America, Justice League Europe was renamed to Justice League International, and DC launched two more companion series in the form of Extreme Justice and Justice League Task Force. While each of these proved to be successful in their own initial introduction, after the departure of DiMatteis and Griffin in 1991, these various titles were consistently rotated among various artists and writers. As a result, there was very little consistency among the titles, and while efforts were made to incorporate top-tier heroes like Superman, Batman, Aquaman, and The Flash, the constant changes in retcons left fans with a bad taste, and so by 1996, DC cancelled all of the Justice League titles. Launching a three-part miniseries titled A Midsummer's Nightmare, writer Mark Wade and artist Fabian Nassiza disbanded the Justice League International, Europe, Task Force, and Extreme Justice titles. Using this as a platform, under DC editor Mike Carlin, writer Grant Morrison began the new Justice League line titled JLA with a four-issue miniseries called New World Order. Centering on a group of alien invaders referred to as the Hyper Clan, which sought to use mind control as a way to turn Earth citizens against their superheroes, the original Justice League of Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, The Flash, Batman, and Green Lantern came together for the purpose of defeating the Hyper Clan. With the story ending in their success, in January of 1997, the Justice League was renamed to JLA. In addition to this, rather than launching a series of branch-off teams, DC instead chose to focus its efforts on multiple one-shots and miniseries depicting the core Justice League team working alongside other superheroes. Furthermore, with Morrison departing after issue number 41, the series saw stories under the writing of Joe Kelly, Mark Wade, Kurt Busaic, and Bob Harris. However, since this new league included most of DC's most powerful heroes, the focus of the stories changed in that the league now only dealt with earth-shattering, highest-priority threats, which could challenge their tremendous combined power. In addition, because almost all of the members had their own comics, the stories were almost always self-contained, with all chapters occurring within JLA itself and very rarely affecting events outside of that series. As a result, while the continuity was easy to follow, during the events of 2005's Infinite Crisis, which served as one of several crises designed to correct the continuity issues that remained following Crisis on Infinite Earths, 
DC had elected to cancel the JLA title as part of their series of retcons in order to reboot the series yet again with a more refreshing look at the characters. To this end, in 2006, following the conclusion of Infinite Crisis, under writer Brad Meltzer, DC introduced Justice League of America Volume 2, issue number 0. Serving as a jumping off platform, issue number 0 saw Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman meeting for the purpose of reforming the League, and by the time the story completed, had a roster composed of the aforementioned heroes in addition to the Green Lantern Hal Jordan, Black Canary, Red Arrow, Red Tornado, Vixen, Black Lightning, and Hot Girl. While the popularity of this team would prove to be equally successful in comparison to its previous iterations, following the Flashpoint event in 2011 and the launch of the New 52, the Justice League of America title was cancelled once again and replaced by the Justice League series under the writing of Jeff Johns. With that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.